U.S. leadership is extremely important because we are the innovation leaders globally. And, and so as we develop uh, these new innovative approaches to energy, it has an impact on, on the global economy and on the resources and, and types of technology available to other countries. You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of subjects that matter most to business leaders. I'm Steve Odlin from the Conference Board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we're going to discuss a new solutions brief from the Committee for Economic Development, which is the public policy center of the Conference Board. The brief provides the energy transition roadmap for the U.S. to reach the goal of net zero emissions by 2050. Joining me today is Dr. Lori Esposito-Murray, the president of CED. Welcome, Lori. Thanks, Steve. Glad to be here. Talked about this important topic. So, Lori, your, your new paper lays out a roadmap to get to carbon neutrality by 2050. Where'd that come from, that, that 2050, and why is carbon neutrality important? Okay, so the 2050 goal really comes from the Paris Agreement, which the U.S. re-entered in 2021, as you know. And uh, the Paris Accord looked to uh, really reducing or the degree of um, global warming to two degrees Celsius. Really, 1.5 is is the preferred goal, but between 1.5 and two degrees Celsius. And so they set out a pathway to 2050 to achieve net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, We have about uh, 124 countries are part of the Paris Agreement, and uh, they actually codified uh, this um, level in the Glasgow Climate Pact uh, at COP26 in 2021. So why is it important? Well, since uh, the pre-industrial levels, uh, pre-industrial times, we've had a 1.1 degree rise in temperatures, and most of that is uh, due to carbon concentration in the atmosphere. And so that's what makes it important. So uh, what what is really carbon neutrality? Does that mean no carbon emissions from anywhere on earth? No, it's net carbon emissions. And so that's very important to remember the net carbon emissions, because in this debate, Uh, It usually gets lost in translation, and you have people focusing on zero and on net. Net carbon emissions recognizes that fossil fuels will probably most likely be still part, although a very much reduced part, of uh, our energy energy policies. Our mix, Um, yeah. It's part of the energy mix. And that net zero means you can have carbon storage, carbon capture, uh, but you're making sure that it's net zero. Okay. And so is it, d- does the Paris Accord and this, this uh, you know, this 2050 goal include just carbon or does it deal with other forms of, of uh, you know, global warming emissions? It deals with other forms. It is, it's greenhouse gas emissions. Exactly. Okay. And, and that includes, you know, it includes carbon, of course, but but methane and other forms, yeah, hydrofluor- of- yeah, other hydrofluorocarbons, right? And so, if if you think if in order to get to this twenty fifty, then does every this goal, this global goal, does every country in the world have to do this, or you know, can some countries skate by while other countries take the uh, the heavy load? Uh, it is it is a global to reach a global goal which, and this has to be global, you have to have a global commitment. Everyone needs to be on board, but obviously the largest admitters are extremely important. And so the largest admitters include China, uh, which is, they emit about 27% of the carbon. You have the US is second with 11%. You have Russia, you have India in that mix as well. Uh, You've got to get the largest admitters on board, which is why working with China on, global climate issues is of critical importance and why we're reading a lot, a lot about it in the news uh, with our, all of the recent visits of high-level officials to China. But this is a global goal and it, it needs uh, to have a global commitment, especially among the emerging economies, to make sure that they're 
developing economies that aren't based on, on uh, high levels of carbon energy uh, sources. So just repeat a couple of those. So China is 27% and the U.S. is 11% of global emissions. Right. Is that what you said? So, you know, that's a huge difference. I don't think people really realize what percentage of the global emissions are, are China. And, and yet China is, continues to produce or, or implement or start up you know, a coal-fired plant per month. And and so, I mean, they're not even talking gas at this point. It's it's coal, which is which is the worst possible e emitter. So, you know, there's there's a, a lot of heavy work to do there because we spin through the same air. And and so hence this global discussion and the and the global goal that you're describing is really important, isn't it? Right. And as I was mentioning, we've had some significant high-level visits uh with the Chinese and it this was uh front and foremost on the agenda for uh, our Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. It was is on the agenda with uh, Secretary of State Blinken. Uh, we, it's impossible to do this without, without collaborating with China, 27% emissions, as you said, also second largest global economy, and also um, is very much involved in the developing of the economies and the emerging economies and the low-income economies around the world and supporting uh, their energy um, programs. Yeah, and and so that that that's terrific. And, and hence the you know the Paris Accords were an attempt to bring the global community together on this. Um, so with the U.S., I mean, if the U.S. got to zero and you know eliminated eleven percent, that'd be great. But you know, to your point you've got to get everybody else to reduce this in order to really solve the issue and get get to two degrees centigrade below it. Um, your paper talks about strategies for the US. That was been, that was the focus of the paper. But a lot of your your strategies are also applicable to you know for other nations to follow. Uh, yes, absolutely. And uh, you, I, I do want to point out though that US leadership is extremely important because we are the innovation leaders globally. And, and so as we develop uh, these new innovative approaches to energy, it has an impact on, on the global economy and on the resources and, and types of technology available to other countries. So absolutely critical in terms of you know, why US leadership uh, is important here, along with uh, the fact that um, uh, we're one of the, uh, you know, the larger emitters of greenhouse gas. So what just um, top line, what would be the cost to the U.S. to achieve the goals here in the U.S.? Uh, so in terms of cost uh, to the U.S., uh, the conference board, as you know, is estimating that the U.S. would need to dedicate about 6.4 to 6.9 percent of GDP per year to the energy transition between now and 2050. Uh, so, you know, that's a that's about equal to what Europe will have to do. Uh, and uh, but it's it's far less than the share of many developing economies that still rely heavily on coal and oil for energy. So, but that's that's a very significant investment. Uh, but you also have to look at it in terms of um, that we are hopefully going to be developing uh, energy sources that uh, will have opportunities for profitability uh, going forward. Uh, and um, there's also you have to measure that against the cost of uh, uh, climate catastrophes and and the dangers that uh, global warming present uh, in terms of cost and expense over that same period of time. Right, but that percentage of GDP, you know, is significantly higher than all the defense spending that that we do as a nation. So, I, I mean, it's a big. It it sounds like a single digit number, but it's a really really big number. So, and that's 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 you know that. Spending is not happening today, so that's that's an incremental, uh, an increment of spending that uh, that needs to happen, and and the financing of that is is pretty important because it's you know it's either debt financed, which of course you know as we've written, you, we the U.S. really cannot pile on more debt, or it's it's you know required that revenue is raised to do this, which means taxes. Well, we have to look at it real, realistically, and it's going to be real. You know, it, it's going to be a significant investment, both publicly and by uh, pri private business. But what you hope to come out at the end of this is that one, that will be leaders in this technology globally, uh, that the cost of, of uh, climate 
change uh, happening without doing anything or just even pursue, you know, proceeding where we are now is going to be very significantly higher. Uh, and um, uh, but it is a it is a major commitment and it's going to uh, require uh, compromise and sacrifice from other goals. Uh, and and uh, it we need to determine as a nation, uh, which we or at least on that course now uh, that this is a priority uh, and and critical not only to our well-being but to uh, uh, global well-being. But if we if we do this, I mean it 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 it's going to re require a complete reprioritization of of our priorities, our, our our national priorities, and our spending, and a, and a lot a lot of money to come out of the economy. And if ninety percent of the emissions are elsewhere in the world, and nobody else does this, we will put our economy at a serious disadvantage wouldn't we so we it, it, the way to look at this steve is one you absolutely need global cooperation you absolutely need global cooperation among the highest emitters and and you know i come back to china i come back to india i come back to russia uh you need that global uh cooperation and particularly with china uh and so absolutely critical uh there are going to be opportunities that are involved with being a leader in this technology and a leader globally. Uh, so upside economically uh, for businesses uh, and for the US economy uh, in terms of innovation actually uh, developing into uh, technologies and, and energy sources that, that uh, we can share around the world. Uh, so look at it, you have to look at it within that context. And also, as I've been saying, that the estimates on the cost of climate damage that will happen if we do nothing starting from here are uh, significantly higher. And, and, you know, in terms of looking at the cost to business as well as, as to the cost uh, to the um, U.S. fiscal budget uh, in terms of disaster relief. So when you know when economists look at this, they look at the the two degree Celsius reduction, and they say, well, this will this will this reduction will save us X amount in you know weather related damages, and and you know on and on and on. You, you know you you might want to go through that, but but what happens? You know there are a lot of there, there's carbon that is driving um, greenhouse gases, including carbon that are driving the temperature, but there are also natural things that are happening and. Um, you know, so what happens if we spend all this money and the global temperature doesn't go down? And so therefore there's no savings and, and we still have the problem, right? Well, we especially don't want the global temperature to go up. Uh, so that that's really what the, the challenge and the um, objective is right now, uh, to not have it go up. Because if it goes up, we're going to be dealing with um, more significant problems facing us. Um, so, so that's that's really key. And and the other piece of this is, you know, there are uh, policies that that could be put in place if the U.S. is so far ahead of where the rest of the world is, you know, including. Um, uh, what, what is considered a a border tariff? You know that you charge countries that uh, a, a tariff that um, are not uh, invested in in the 2050 or the 2060 2070 uh, goals of the uh, Paris Accord. Uh, so there 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 are policies you could pursue. There are pros and cons of those uh, uh, in a way of protecting. Um, the U.S. economy from the uh, from being out there and first, but you know, as I mentioned, if we're out there and first as we are uh, normally in, in, with the innovation economy that we have, based on market principles, if we pursue this in terms of market principles, and make sure that our industrial policy has the uh, and this is an industrial policy has the flexibility, the responsiveness, smart regulation. Uh, to get us where we need to be so that we're not at a losing end at 2050, having pursued all the wrong forces. That's all part of the recommendations we make. We've got to use the money we're investing now wisely, and it's a historic amount uh, just within the past year or so. We've got to make sure we're doing that uh, smartly and wisely and need to continue to do that. And you have to base it on market uh, principles. We're discussing plans to get the U.S. to carbon neutrality by 2050. We're going to take a short break and be right back. Are you ready to transform your business and stay ahead of the competition? 
Artificial intelligence is quietly reshaping the global economy, optimizing manufacturing processes, and transforming how users interact with popular platforms. Harnessing the power of AI can exponentially enhance your business's effectiveness and efficiency. However, navigating the risks associated with this transformative technology is critical. Privacy, integrity, the economy, and humanity are all at stake. That's why the Conference Board is your go-to resource for the expertise and foresight you need to leverage AI to its fullest potential and make strategic moves that propel your business forward. Unlock the possibilities AI offers your business. Visit tcb.org slash AI today to access trusted insights for what's ahead and guidance on navigating the AI transformation. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin from the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Dr. Lori Esposito-Murray, the president of the Committee for Economic Development, which is the public policy center of the Conference Board. Okay, so Lori, um, you've just written this paper. It's a very thorough set of recommenda policy recommendations on how the U.S. can get to uh, carbon neutrality or greenhouse gas neut neutrality by 2050. Maybe you can, you know, it's a long paper. There's a lot of detail, but maybe you could tick off, you know, the major recommendations in the paper. Okay. So what's really important here and uh, first and foremost is that uh, business and government work together. That is the overriding uh, principle here in terms of where we need to go and uh, how we get there. Right now, there's a lot of conflict uh, between, particularly between the fossil fuel companies and the US government. And we can't pursue this type of investment and try to achieve these really outsized goals uh, for 2050 without working together. So I really wanna underscore, underscore that. Uh, absolutely key, what, what we were just talking about, Steve, was the responsible implementation of these historic climate-related funding provisions, and they are historic. There's $384 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act, $75 billion uh, in the Infrastructure Bipartisan Bill, another $14 billion in research, and mostly focused on research and development of the CHIPS Act, really significant funding. Make sure we're doing it wisely uh, and coordinating with business, coordinating with the state and local governments. We have to expand the use of zero carbon energy sources. And so uh, key in there, and what's really interesting is that uh, you know, uh, men, a number of analysts are saying that we can't get to 2050 net zero uh, without nuclear power, uh, but we also have to do the R&D, the investment in wind and solar. Uh, they have reliability problems right now in terms of an energy so source. And we have to also look at uh, blue and green hydrogen, the clean hydrogen, uh, particularly in the sex sectors of the economy like transportation that are, uh, or, or the in terms of trucking and transportation that are the uh, more difficult areas in terms of uh, clean energy. Uh, smart regulation, as we mentioned, uh, and make sure we're looking at this at a sector basis. First and you know, first and foremost, as we discussed at the top, ensure that it's global climate cooperation. Those are those are some of the key recommendations that we have, uh, and reducing methane and hydrochlorocarbons uh, uh, emissions in all the sectors is also really important. Okay, so a lot of this, obviously, there's a ton of detail behind each one of those, and you know, and we're not going to go into that today, but but you know, clearly, this transition relies on you know a shift in how electricity is produced and the sources of that production to renewables and to to nuclear um, but there's also the whole shift then to the uh, the electrification of as much as possible let's just put it that way including you know most of transportation but there isn't the transmission capacity uh, in order to achieve that so does does your recommendation include, the you know the the development of the grid the hardening of the grid and, and you know all of those components uh top priorities are you know grid modernizing the grid but also a top priority as you were just mentioning is is permitting and permitting so that we can do the transmit transmission uh uh, pipelines so that, uh, you know, cross states, cross regions, and to do it in a really timely basis. Steve, you know this, you worked 
uh, very hard and, and looked at um, uh, very deeply the infrastructure uh, issue during, uh, uh, as a head of that commission, uh, the commission and the Bush administration. The time delays uh, involved in uh, permitting exponentially increased the cost uh, yeah. of, of our programs. And so one, you need it in order to achieve your electrification goals, but you also need it in terms of uh, uh, re really addressing the, the major challenge uh, that, of the cost that's, that's involved in this energy transition. Yeah, and, and so you know, implicit in this is that the grid needs to be expanded. It needs to be modernized. You know, right now we're overcooking some of these lines. You know, yep. and and we've got to you know we've got to expand it. Um, clearly, forest fires have been caused by these by these lines, and so lots of work needs to go into this. You know, bury them where you can and so forth. But there needs to be more. Certainly, needs to be more capacity, and so that's. That's part of your overall number uh, in, in the investment as well, isn't it? Right, right. And also, you know, I, I do want to mention, because we have an excellent example uh, in terms of the uh, repair of I-95 in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, when it was anticipated that that repair would take X number of months, years before I-95 would be back to working the way it needed to work. One of the major things that they did in a repair that actually took uh, weeks as opposed to years uh, was permitting. And yeah. they, no, they- It's clear it was just a little bridge, but you know, a little bridge can take years to permit and, and all these things hold it up. And that's, you're exactly right. I mean, that, that is what you know, the, are the, the transmission companies will tell you that they, they can't get permits, they can't get permission, they can't get environmental. Uh, get through the environmental rules, and so they don't add any 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 capacity. But you know, you're trying to bring on all of these electric cars, and if you're going to fire up these electric cars, you have to have you have to have more power. We're already doing rolling brownouts in some areas of the country, and so um, you know, so that just it just simply has to be addressed. Which means, and, and this goes back to your point about businesses and the government working together hand in hand. The government's got to help here. Yeah, and and uh, Steve, the most important sector, obviously, you know, the transportation sector is important in terms of um, uh, reliable sources, but the most important sector, uh, if you're looking at the economy, is manufacturing. Uh, we can't be. We're trying to bring a lot of manufacturing home for other reasons: the lessons of COVID, reliable supply chains, uh, and and trying to bring that manufacturing home. Uh, manufacturing can't. Uh, survive with unreliable uh, uh, energy transmission. Well, and there's a, you know, it's a little off the subject, but the regulate, the regulatory uh, story, you know, goes there too. I mean, you can't put up a manufacturing plant without going through all the permitting and all the, the environmental approvals. It's easier to just move it to, you know, some other area of the world that doesn't have that, but then you're just pushing the problems, you know, and the emission issues elsewhere too. This is why it is important uh, on any number of levels for there to be, um, you know, there to be a public private partnership in all of this, as you said, let's go back to nuclear though, because there is nuclear has is zero carbon output. It is, it is, uh, uh, it, it provides a great base. It doesn't say you, you know, you do away with renewables, but renewables are episodic, you know, wind blows sometimes it doesn't other times sunshine sometimes and not others. Um, so nuclear provides a great base, but there seems to be an anti-nuclear sentiment in the country. Talk about that. Uh, well, definitely an anti-nuclear sentiment, not only here, but uh, in Europe and globally. Uh, Japan, you know, we've had a number of major nuclear crises, uh, you know, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, which is the one I, I perhaps the most significant nuclear uh, crisis that we've dealt with, Fukushima. So a lot of concerns. There is a major transitioning happening in the te technology with these small nuclear reactors. And so, and a matter of fact, uh, one of the uh, experimental programs that uh, the Department of Energy is launching to go back to our conversation about manufacturing is actually with manufacturing companies and, and um, starting to have a couple of experimental programs going using small nuclear reactors. Uh, this could be a real game changer for nuclear energy. Uh, there are still proliferation concerns as far as uh, moving to small nuclear reactors. How do you make sure that 
it, it doesn't uh, exacerbate even further the nuclear proliferation problem in terms of uh, weapons grade material being out there or being uh, used for um, weapons development. But in terms of actual safer power generation, uh, it's a game changer. Yeah, and I th so I think there needs to be a campaign, a certainly an educational awareness campaign around nuclear so that people understood the facts. I mean, nobody nobody was killed at Three Mile Island. There was no leakage. It was it was a human error. Somebody somebody oper it was an operational error within the plant at that time. Um, Chernobyl was a um, <laughs> was a construction. Let's just call it a construction problem. So uh, you know, a, a subpar uh, cement that was used to cut corners and that and and that created you know, a terrible meltdown. The Fukushima situation, it was hit by a typhoon. Well, you know, should we be building these plants in the path of potential typhoons? No. So we have to think about siting on these things. So, you know, I, there are, those are the three big disasters, but all three of them, you know, is, are pretty much man-made. And, uh, uh, and so I, there's gotta be, so it, without going into detail, I'm, I'm just saying that people need to understand this. There needs to be you know, controls around this and it can and it can be safe. Now the waste issues are still another one. You've got to be able to store the waste safely and and uh, not have it dispersed and you know certainly not have it land in the uh, in the hands of terrorists or you know other folks that will do bad things with it. So so there's control issues. Yeah, and but the other the other piece of this, just coming back to where the technology is, it is very different technology. It's safer technology in terms of um, shutting down the smaller nuclear reactors, uh, the responsiveness, and so it really is uh, to your point, um, uh, and you know, an issue that uh, education um, really has to be a component of making sure that. Uh, what the new technology is, uh, the risks and the benefits are, are well known. It's it's actually a debate taking place in Europe, believe it or not. Uh, they're you know reconsidering uh, their position. A number of countries are reconsidering their position on on nuclear reactors, given the very different types of technology that the small nuclear reactors uh, present. Yeah, and they were really the leaders in it. I mean, they had France at one time had 80% of its uh, electricity generated by nuclear, Germany as well. Now, Germany's backed off of that because of some concerns, but, but I, you know, there's, there's a great, a great level of, um, uh, of possibility here. Now, the other place is, uh, is battery uh, technology, which needs to happen because, it, you know, with the episodic nature of the renewables, um, you can level that through battery storage, right? And so, you know, and, and so, but the issue is we can't be using rare earth minerals and, you know, dependent on, on one country in the world for those minerals. So, you know, th things like sodium battery technology and, and other more accessible forms uh, are really necessary uh, to advance this, uh, th this strategy as well. And that, that's only become even more important within the past couple of uh, days and weeks. So we just had another um, uh, important red flag raised when you know China's response to what's happening with semiconductors and and the fact that they're going through a more rigorous they announced a more rigorous licensing pr um, uh, process in order to be able to uh, export their rare earth uh, minerals needed for uh, these technologies. You know, just uh, that's a, another red flag, another wake up call that we have to find alternatives, and that's really through. And it's so significant uh, accelerating the R&D uh, across the board, but particularly uh, with regard to batteries. Absolutely. Yeah. And if we don't get there, we do have the rare earth minerals in this country as well. But we, you know, then we would have to figure out a way to mine them and do so in a way that uh, doesn't damage the environment and all of those things. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Any last thoughts from your paper that you'd like to share? Well, the one thing we didn't mention is uh, in terms of workforce training, this is going to be absolutely critical. We, we, you know, as, as you well know, and as our listeners well know, we have a labor shortage. Uh, this Transitioning to, th this is a major challenge and a major transition. Uh, to do it right, we have to have the components we talked about, especially the acceleration of R&D. Uh, smart regulation is absolutely critical, but labor force training is, is key here. Without the, the labor force uh, with the skills, 
uh, to transition uh, uh, our economy to greener, uh, cleaner uh, energy sources. Uh, we're, we're just not going to get there. And so we need to uh, really make sure that that we, and, I, and that's, the, that's the private sector, uh, I think needs to be focusing on this, uh, particularly needs to be looking at work, workforce training. Dr. Lori Esposito-Murray, thanks for joining us today. Okay, thank you, Steve, really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover the leading topics in economics, geopolitics, public policy, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives with your colleagues, with your friends, with anyone who cares about carbon. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You have been listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board.